Welcome aboard. Thanks for joining another tour. We are at the Guntersville Municipal Airport, also known as the Joe Starnes Field, which has the airport code 8A1. It's located three miles north of the city of Guntersville, just off Highway 431 here in Alabama. And we are at the airport because in 1985, the singer Rick Nelson departed from this airport with his band. They were headed to Dallas to play a New Year's Eve celebration. They never made it to Dallas. The plane ended up crashing just outside of DeKalb, Texas. Today, we will be talking about the Rick Nelson story and what happened those last few days. And that's why we are here at the Joe Starnes Airport. Joe Starnes represented Alabama's 5th Congressional District from January 1935 to January 1945 and is how the airfield got its name. The airport covers an area of 55 acres and is at an elevation of 615 feet or 187 meters above mean sea level. The airfield has one runway with an asphalt surface measuring 5,005 feet by 75 feet or 1,525 by 23 meters. The runway is designated in each direction as 07 and 25. Interestingly enough, they also, on the water nearby the airfield here, have a seaplane runway in a dock area. It's designated as 6W and 24W. It's located uh, just north of the airport. Today, we are flying the Douglas DC-3. Let me get the cockpit set up. We'll get the aircraft started so we can get the plane taxied and in the air so we can start our tour. What we do here on Dude Tours is we take interesting stories or events and we find the locations of these events in Microsoft Flight Simulator. We're just finding the locations and discussing the events. With that, we may fly the same aircraft if it's available in the flight sim, but it may be a different variant or it may have modern instruments. The Douglas DC-3 is a twin-engine, propeller-driven passenger aircraft. First flown in 1935, the Douglas DC-3 became the most successful airliner in the formative years of air transportation and was the first to fly profitably without government subsidies. More than 13,000 DC-3s were manufactured both for civilian and military uses. The aircraft was an enlarged variant of the 14-seat DC-2. The 21-seat DC-3 was comfortable by the standards of the time and it was considered very safe. The airlines liked it because it was reliable, inexpensive to operate, and therefore it was profitable. Pilots liked it because of its stability, its ease of handling, and its excellent single-engine performance if needed. During World War II, the DC-3 was also used as a military transport aircraft by the US Army Air Force and by other military organizations around the world. After the war, many of those aircrafts were converted for other uses, including corporate transport, crop dusting, and firefighting aircraft. Ricky Nelson was an American musician, singer, and actor who rose to fame in the 1950s and 1960s as a teen idol. He was born Eric Hilliard Nelson on May 8, 1940 in Teaneck, New Jersey, and was the second son of Ozzie and Harriet Nelson, who were popular radio and television personalities. His parents, Oswald George Ozzie Nelson and Harriet Hilliard, were popular entertainers rising to fame in the 1930s. Ozzie fronted a dance band and had a number one hit in 1935 with And Then Some. You got me dazzled and frantic, excited, romantic, and then some. Harriet was a movie actress and became Ozzy's lead singer three years before she became his wife in 1935. Unfortunately for the Nelsons in the 1940s, the big band era was changing. The best jazz musicians were now performing in concert venues and not just small clubs, pushing out the demand for the big band acts. Ozzy was not an accomplished instrumentalist, so Ozzy just continued to pursue a living in the old vaudeville style of performing. Vaudeville was America's first large version of show business. The growth was made possible by the nationwide expansion of railroads from the Civil War onward. A vaudeville show was comprised of a series of unrelated variety acts such as comedy, singing, dancing, juggling, aerobatics, illusionists, uh, ventriloquists, and puppetry all performed either solo or in groups. Ozzy performed these one-nighters on the road while Harriet and the children remained home in Tenafly, New Jersey.
The adventures of Ozzy and Harriet started out slow but gained momentum. The show centered around the real-life personalities of the couple. We have completed our taxi and we are ready for takeoff. Mm-hmm. What's that? Love and Kisses movie style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Your love and kisses. Uh-huh. Rick Nelson, America's favorite singing son, stirs up a storm with his Love and Kisses. One, yeah, two, yeah, three yeah. song hits is only Rick can sing them. Four, yeah, five, yeah, six hundred yeah. surprises in this hollabaloo movie of marriage teenage style. Yeah, Seven, eight, yeah, nine hundred yeah. funny complications when Rick brings his blushing teenage bride home to mom for their honeymoon. are airborne for the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet radio show the characters of David and Ricky the sons were included in the first season they were only mentioned as part of the storyline and weren't actually part of the cast when the time came to introduce the children two young actors were hired David and Ricky soon pressured their parents to play themselves during this time the show moved from CBS to NBC and then on to ABC on February 20th, 1949, David and Ricky made their first appearances on the radio show in an episode called Invitation to Dinner. In 1950, ABC offered the Nelsons a television show based on the radio format. Ozzy decided to test the idea first as a movie. In 1951, Here Comes the Nelsons played in drive-in theaters and cinemas. <laughs> Say, don't I know you from somewhere? Good morning. Don't tell me you finally decided to get up. You and millions of other radio fans have wanted to see the Nelsons in all their hilarious glory. And here they are, the most listened to, the most laughed at, best loved family in radio. The movie earned a moderate box office profit, but had proven the Nelsons were ready for their own television show. Ricky would begin his musical career at a young age while appearing on that television show. Singing on the show, by the age of seven, Ricky had quickly become the audience favorite. By the time he was a teenager, he had released several successful singles and was well on his way to becoming a pop star. The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, television sitcom, aired from 1952 to 1966. It was one of the longest-running live-action family sitcoms in the history of American television and followed the lives of the Nelson family, consisting of band leader Ozzy, his wife Harriet, and their two sons, David and Ricky. The show was known for its wholesome, family-friendly humor and was widely praised for its positive portrayal of family life. Primarily a comedy, although it included musical performances by Ozzy and Ricky. In 1957, Ricky had his first hit single, I'm Walkin', which reached the top ten on Billboard charts. He continued to release hit after hit, including Poor Little Fool, Travelin' Man, and Hello Mary Lou, which all reached number one on the charts. We never part, so hello Mary Lou, goodbye heart. With his good looks and clean-cut image, Ricky was soon one of the biggest teen idols of the 1950s. During the 1950s and 1960s, he produced some of his most popular songs, Poor Little Fool in 1958, Travelin' Man in 1961, Hello Mary Lou in 1961, It's Late 1959, Young World in 1960, Never Be Anyone Else But You 1959, Lonesome Town in 1958, Sweeter Than You in 1960, Believe What You Say 1958, and Bebop Baby in 1957, just to name a few. Ricky had several other hits throughout his career and was one of the first artists to successfully cross over from television and movies to a successful music career. His style combined elements of rock and roll, country and pop, and his good looks and easygoing persona made him a popular entertainer with audiences of all ages. In addition to his musical career, Ricky also had a fairly successful acting career. He appeared in several films including Love and Kisses in 1965 and Rio Bravo in 1959 in which he starred alongside John Wayne and Dean Martin. 
time my sweetheart passed, she take a bite of me. She told me that she loved me. She called me sugar plum. She threw her arms around me. I thought my time had come. Get along home, Cindy, Cindy. Get along home, Cindy. He also made guest appearances on television shows, including The Love Boat and Murder, She Wrote. Unfortunately, by the mid-1960s, Ricky's music became eclipsed by the British pop invasion, and in 1966, The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet was canceled. While he continued to record and sing and perform, he just couldn't regain that success he once had as the audience moved to a newer, faster musical genre. In 1961, Ricky began dating Kristen Harmon. She was the daughter of football player Tom Harmon and actress Elise Knox. In the mid-1960s, Ricky began to move towards country music, becoming a pioneer in the country rock genre. He was one of the early influences of the so-called California sound, which would include singers like Jackson Brown and Linda Ronstadt in bands such as the Eagles. Ricky did not reach the top 40 with this sound until 1970 when he recorded Bob Dylan's She Belongs to Me with the Stone Canyon Band. In 1972, Ricky, now known just as Rick Nelson, reached the top 40 one last time with Garden Party, a song he wrote in disgust after a Richard Nader oldies concert at Madison Square Garden, where he believed the audience had booed him. Richard Nader was a disc jockey and promoter who advanced the concept of oldies as a genre in music. He began with his first rock and roll revival concert on October 18, 1969, featuring Chuck Berry, The Platters, and Bill Haley and the Comets. It's believed the booing heard was for an unrelated event occurring in the crowd. However, Rick felt that the reason was that he was playing his new songs instead of just his old hits. It was while he was performing his version of the Rolling Stones' Honky Tonk Woman that he heard the booing. Later, as he was watching a TV monitor backstage, Richard Nader finally convinced Rick to return to the stage and play his oldies. He returned to the stage, he played all his old hits, and the audience responded pretty positively. I went to a garden party, reminisced with my old friend, a chance to share old memories, play a song. By 1975, his marriage had deteriorated and there was a very public breakup involving both the famous families going on and it was covered in the press for several years. For a while, the couple had temporarily resolved their differences. Chris wanted Rick to give up music and touring and spend more time at home and focus on acting, but those close to the couple said the issue was that they both enjoyed what was described as a recklessly expensive lifestyle and that left Rick with no choice but to tour relentlessly. In October 1977, Chris filed for a divorce, including significant alimony, custody of their children, and a portion of their current property. Kristen and Rick had four children. Their first, daughter Tracy, was born on October 25, 1963. Twin sons, Gunnar and Matthew, born on September 20, 1967, and Sam, born on August 29, 1974. After years of legal proceedings, the two were divorced in December of 1982. The divorce was believed to be financially devastating for Rick. The previous year, 1981, had opened for Rick with the release of his first record, Playing to Win, in more than three years, and his fifth label with Capitol Records, resulting in his music enjoying a bit of a minor revival. Rick had also met a fan named Helen Blair, a part-time model and exotic animal trainer in Las Vegas, and she became his constant companion and eventually his fiancée. As the demand for Rick's music resurged, so did the need for quick transportation to travel to his increasing tour dates. He was accustomed to using a Learjet, but in May of 1985, he upgraded to a 14-seat Douglas DC-3, which was built in 1944, with a livery of white with gold and black trim. The aircraft was also owned at one point by retired rocker Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry Lee Lewis was a hard-driving rockabilly artist whose iconic piano-pounding, boogie-woogie, bluesy style and country-influenced vocals helped define the sound of rock and roll. He was known for his hits, Whole lot of Shaking Going On and Great Balls of Fire. You broke my wheel, my brother's wheel, you raise the great balls of fire. Rick paid $118,000 for this historic aircraft at the time, and despite the popularity of jets over propeller-driven planes at this time, the cost was the driving factor, and Rick was said to have learned to enjoy this old warbird. He was now residing in the former Errol Flynn estate on Mulholland Drive in Los Angeles with his fiancée Helen Blair and his daughter Tracy. 
With a new record contract signed, his agent started booking a series of tour dates, resulting in Rick being on the road an average of 250 nights a year with his Stone Canyon band. The band was comprised of lead guitarist Bobby Neal, drummer Rick Infeld, bass player Pat Woodward, and keyboardist Andy Chapin. Throughout 1984 and 1985, Rick and the band toured all around North America. On October 31st, 1985, the band flew commercially to London for an 18-day tour of the British Isles, including two shows at London's Royal Albert Hall. Once back in the United States, his touring schedule resumed in Orlando, Florida on December 27, 1985, with their next engagement following that slated for New Year's Eve in Dallas. Rick's manager, Greg McDonald, contacted Pat Upton, a former guitarist with the band and who now owned a bar in Guntersville, Alabama, and he booked a couple shows at that venue. Rick would earn the door money, and he and Pat, who were old friends, could visit for a while. Pat said they were in Orlando, and to just sit on the road cost lots of money. He said they were going to have to fly home to Los Angeles and then go back to Dallas, so they came here instead to play a couple nights. On Saturday, December 28th, they left for Alabama. Don Dudley, the general manager of Executive Air Charter at Orlando Executive Airport, said the DC-3 took on only fuel and oil before leaving for Guntersville. But the pilot, Brad Rank, told workers he was having problems with the aircraft, but also said, all we have to do is get the plane back to California and we won't need it after that. They assumed he meant that they were going to sell it. The band then traveled from Orlando, Florida to Guntersville, Alabama to play at PJ's Alley. That was Pat Upton's 4,000 square foot venue that was a converted tire store and warehouse. The DC-3 made an uneventful landing that evening. The band unloaded all of their gear and were driven to the venue in town. Rick and the Stone Canyon band took the stage that was erected in front of a bare brick wall and played two sold out performances. Pat then asked Rick to stay for a third show on Monday night, to which he agreed. He was staying at the nearby Holiday Inn. On Monday afternoon, Rick and his fiance visited Pat Upton's family for about an hour, then went to the venue and played the show. Rick closed the show, which was another sold-out night, with a cover of Buddy Holly's song, Rave On. Ironically, Buddy Holly himself had also chosen this song to close what would be his last performance at Clear Lake, Iowa on February 3, 1959. Rick's final words on stage that evening were, Rave on for me, as he and the band left the stage. He spent another night in room 106 at the Guntersville Holiday Inn before flying to Dallas the next morning, which was New Year's Eve 1985, to entertain at the Park Suite Hotel. At the Park Suite Hotel, a 25-foot stage had been erected in the center of the lobby of the tower-like building so that guests could drink champagne on New Year's Eve and watch the show from their balconies. All 250 suites had sold out at $170 a piece, and another 500 people had purchased tickets for the seats on the floor to watch the show. That morning, the flight crew intended to depart Guntersville around 10 a.m. However, there were problems with the plane that required some mechanical repairs. According to the Guntersville airport manager Dick Lusk, they had a little fuel primer problem, that's all. Nevertheless, the repair work delayed the departure by four hours, during which time the group stayed in the airport terminal playing games and eating. They reboarded the DC-3 at about 2 p.m. for Dallas Love Field, about 450 miles away. During that flight, about three hours and eight minutes into the flight, while at an altitude of 6,000 feet, the flight crew contacted Fort Worth Center, saying, I think I'd like to turn around, head for Texarkana here. I've got a little problem. The air traffic controller provided the crew with radar vectors to several airports. However, a short time later, pilot Brad Rank advised the controller that he would be unable to make those airports. At 5.11 p.m., he radioed that there was smoke in the cabin. At approximately 5.14 p.m. local time on December 31st, the plane crash-landed outside of DeKalb, Texas, northeast of Dallas, in a cow pasture less than 2 miles or 3.2 kilometers from the landing strip hitting trees and power poles on its way down. Helicopter pilot Don Ruggles said he heard the radio distress call about 5 p.m. He said the plane was flying at what he estimated to be about 8,000 feet and having difficulty. He heard the pilot say smoke was filling the cockpit, adding, I watched the airplane descend to a very low altitude, about 500 feet above the ground, and then we started noticing smoke trailing from the airplane. The plane clipped two electric power poles and came to rest in flames about 200 yards from a farmhouse. 
pilot Brad Rank and co-pilot Kenneth Ferguson escaped the burning plane through a window. They shouted to the passengers in the cabin, but there was no response. The pilots then backed away from the plane, fearing an explosion. Don Ruggles and his wife Mary landed the helicopter near the wreck. They found the surviving duo, the pilot and co-pilot, about a hundred yards from the fire. They were black from burns, Don testified to the NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board. He also testified, even if they had been at a larger airport, I don't believe there was anything that could have been done to get them out. It was a horrible thing seeing seven people perish in that plane, and there wasn't a thing we could do about it. I just regret that we couldn't have got him and the others out. We are approaching the location of the crash site in DeKalb, Texas. It's northeast of Dallas. 16 minutes after the crash, Bob Allison, a helicopter rescue pilot, also landed near where the aircraft had crashed. He said, all I saw was a ball of fire. Don Lewis, a farmer who was out feeding his cattle when the plane flew by, said, it was on fire when it came over me. Smoke was just belching out of the right side. Seven of the nine occupants were killed. Ricky Nelson and his fiancée Helen Blair, sound technician Donald Clark Russell, the Stone Canyon band consisting of Andy Chapin, the pianist, Rick Intvelt, the drummer, Bobby Neal, the guitarist, and Patrick Woodward, the bass player. It took firefighters more than two hours to extinguish the fire, which was fueled by the fuselage's magnesium construction. Both of the pilots were hospitalized with burn injuries. The DC-3 had been known to have engine trouble on previous flights. In September of 1985, Rick flew aboard the aircraft to Memphis after completing some West Coast events. Then leaving Memphis, both engines reportedly backfired and died. So, the group left the airplane in Memphis for repairs and booked commercial flights back to California. Band members had shared their fears with their families about the DC-3's airworthiness. Lead guitarist Bobby Neal's wife Phyllis urged him not to board the airplane. Bassist Patrick Woodward told his wife Jody about two emergency landings. She recalled, He said he was going to die in that airplane and he had said it seriously. Lori Russell, wife of sound technician Clark, said, I hated the plane because every time he went on it I thought it would be the last time. The band hated the plane. Laurie Barzi, the sister-in-law of pianist Andy Chapin, added, He didn't want to go on that airplane. She said Andy told her that it was a real bad plane. He didn't trust it. He always talked to my husband about it and that he didn't trust the airplane, that all the guys felt the same in the band. Ken Ferguson, who was Rick's personal co-pilot, countered this after the crash, saying there was no areas of major concerns with that plane. The reports vary as to whether the plane was actually on fire before it crashed or not, though some witnesses attest that it was indeed in flames while still airborne. However, the NTSB chairman Jim Burnett said that although the plane was filled with smoke, it had landed and come to a stop before it was swallowed by flames. The NTSB conducted a year-long investigation and finally concluded that while a definite cause was still unknown, the crash was probably the result of a fire that was caused by the plane's gasoline-powered cabin heater. When questioned by the NTSB, pilots Brad Rank and Ken Ferguson had different accounts of the events. According to Ken Ferguson, the cabin heater was acting up after the plane took off. He said that Brad Rank repeatedly went to the back of the plane to try to fix the heater and that he eventually told Ken to turn the heater back on. However, Brad Rank told a different story. He said that he was just in the cabin checking on the passengers when he noticed smoke in the middle of the cabin where Rick and Helen were sitting. Even though he never mentioned a problem with the heater, Brad stated that only after seeing the smoke he went to the rear of the plane to check the heater, saw no smoke, and found that the heater was cooled to the touch. He said that after activating an automatic fire extinguisher and opening the cabin's fresh air inlets, he returned to the cockpit where Ken Ferguson was already asking air traffic controllers for directions to the nearest airfield. Brad Rank was criticized by the NTSB for not following the in-flight fire checklist because he was opening the fresh air vents instead of leaving them closed and not instructing the passengers to use supplemental oxygen and not attempting to fight the fire with the handheld fire extinguisher that was in the cockpit. The board said that while these steps might not have prevented the crash, they would have enhanced the potential for survival of the passengers. The words of the NTSB seemed to make sense because firefighter Lewis Glover, one of the first on the scene, stated, all the bodies were there at the front of the airplane. Apparently they were all trying to escape the fire. Rick's 71-year-old mother, Harriet, learned of her son's sudden death in her California home while watching the national news that night. Rick's remains were misdirected in transit from Texas to California. 
an issue that delayed the funeral for seven days. On January 6, 1986, 250 mourners entered the Church of the Hills for funeral services while hundreds of other mourners and fans gathered outside. Rick's 22-year-old daughter Tracy eulogized her father, claiming that he was the kindest man on earth and she would remember him for his grace, gentleness, wisdom, and class. His twin sons Gunnar and Matthew sang Easy to be Free, while his other son Sam read a poem. Rick was buried days later in the Forest Lawn's Hollywood Hills Cemetery in Los Angeles, California. Days after the funeral, rumors and newspaper reports suggested that cocaine freebasing was one of the several possible causes for the plane crash. Those allegations were refuted by the NTSB. We are approaching Dallas, Texas, which is our final destination today. Despite his untimely death, Rick's music continues to live on. He is remembered as one of the pioneers of rock and roll, and his influence can be heard in the music of countless musicians who have followed in his footsteps. Rick Nelson was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1987. Rick was one of the first musicians to bring rock and roll into the mainstream, and his music helped to bridge the gap between the music of the 1950s and the music of the 1960s. His two twin sons, Matt and Gunnar, are also musicians, and together they form the musical group Nelson, which is a rock band they formed in 1987. They had moved in with their father as soon as they turned 18, just three months before his tragic death, and shortly after they had formed their band. The band was known for its distinctive sound, which combined elements of pop, rock, and hair metal. It was best known for its hit single, After the Rain, which reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart in 1990. The band's music was characterized by its high-energy, guitar-driven sound and its catchy, melodic hooks. They were known for their energetic live performances accompanied by a sense of humor which often infused the music with a light-hearted and tongue-in-cheek quality. In addition to After the Rain, Nelson had several other hit songs including More Than Ever and Only Time Will Tell. While the band's popularity waned in the mid-1990s, it has continued to record and perform over the years. In addition to touring as Nelson, the twin singer-songwriters also perform a separate tribute act for their father called Rick Nelson Remembered. That was a bit about Rick Nelson, his career, and the tragic events that took his life. Now we will head to and land at Dallas Love Field, which was the destination of the aircraft that day and our final destination. If you are enjoying today's tour, the price is pretty reasonable. All you need to do is reach down and hit that subscribe button. It simply lets YouTube know that you enjoy this type of content, and I also appreciate the support. Let's get the plane on the ground in Dallas. Heading up the news this morning, rock and roll singer Rick Nelson was killed last night in a private plane crash in Texas. Officials say that his charter DC-3 caught fire in flight and crashed while trying to make an emergency landing. We have more from KNBC's Matt Stevens. Rick Nelson, his girlfriend Helen Blair, and five band members on their way to a Dallas hotel for a New Year's Eve concert, all killed. The charter Douglas DC-3 reportedly caught fire in mid-air. The pilot tried first to land the plane on a road. In the final stages of their approach, something happened. Either some cars got in the way or something, and they elected to go to a field. And uh, it appeared to me that they probably hit into some trees. We are on the ground here in Dallas, Texas, Dallas Love Field. Airport code DAL is a public airport located in the Love Field neighborhood of Dallas, Texas. It is one of two major airports serving the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area and has a rich history. The airport was established in 1917 as a military training facility and was later named after Moss Lee Love, a U.S. Army aviator who was killed in an air crash in 1913. In the years that followed, Love Field grew in importance as a commercial airport, and by the 1930s, it was one of the busiest airports in the country. In the late 1940s and 1950s, the airport underwent a major renovation and expansion project to accommodate the growing demand for air travel in the United States. Love Field is best known for its role as the departure airport for President John F. Kennedy on November 22, 1963, the day of his assassination here in Dallas. We did a video tour of those events in Dallas with John F. Kennedy, and I'll put the link below in the description. 